years, typically what we've been doing is going through archaeology that proves kind of the progression of the Bible. We were right in the middle of the divided kingdom coming up uh, to the conquest of Babylon, but we're going to shift gears tonight in light of the coronavirus, and we're going to talk about how the church and history has responded to really scary times in these epidemics. Um, particularly, we're going to be looking at the plague of Cyprian that took place in 250 AD. If you're like me, you've been going online all over Facebook, looking at news stories, and you just see one headline after the next about what could be the worst case scenario. And it's comforting and it's smart every once in a while to, to pull back from all those headlines and to give your mind a rest and to refocus ourselves on the eternal truths of what God has promised to us. I was going through my Facebook feed and I came across a Babylon Bee article on Facebook and it said that the headline was, latest numbers on coronavirus, 100% of the world is still under God's control. We got to remind ourselves of that. Like it is so easy to get caught up in all the fear and all the anxiety looking at how this world's idols and all the things that we chase after are really being rocked by this. And they're scary, but we've got to pull back and remind ourselves that we have some things that are absolutely unshakable in Christ. And the guys and, and women in the early church that we're going to talk about today make me jealous of the kind of faith that they had. They took tragedies like plagues and famines and they turned them into incredible opportunities to extend the mercy and love and grace of Christ to a, a world that's idols were just being shaken apart. We know that feeling. But now there's a watching world that's out there and all their idols are being shaken. Their jobs, their reputations, their money, their relationships, all of them right now seem to be getting shaken. And it is an extraordinary opportunity for us to, to pull back, remind ourselves of the security that we have and to press out into the world with the joy and hope and security that can only be found in Christ. You know, you go back, we've talked about this a lot in our spiritual formation classes, but there's something that tends to happen as you go back through history, when God brings great calamities upon the world, we tend to think, you know, oh no, that's terrible, it's, it's awful, and there's parts of it that are sad and grief-stricken, and all that's true, but God tends to use things like plagues and illnesses to advance something far more beautiful that we might not see in the moment. If you go back to the earliest chapters of the Bible and the story of the Exodus, God sends plagues upon Egypt. And as we've talked about, each and every one of those 10 plagues was designed to attack one of the Egyptian gods in their mythology. And it was Literally to take the idols of the Egyptian people and to show the Egyptians you can't trust them. And when the Hebrews, after the 10th plague is done, when they leave Egypt, one of the most beautiful things about that story is the Egyptians. There's Egyptians and Nubians and Ethiopians that go with them that had walked away from all, all their idols and had pledged their lives to God. There's a historian, Rodney Stark, who, who writes extensively about the history in the early church. And in one of his books, he writes that all of the plagues that hit the early Roman Empire didn't serve to shrink the church. It was through those plagues, it was in those moments of crisis where the rest of the world didn't know where they could find solid footing, that the model behavior of the church imitating the love of Christ to this watching world made the church explode. It grew leaps and bounds. People saw the hope and the security that these Christians had, and they wanted some of it. And so let's go back. I want, I want to take you, and there's gonna, we're going to read a lot of passages. I want you to hang with me, but I want your imagination to let you go back to 250 AD, enter into that Roman world, 
And what was the prevailing attitude of the Romans toward the sick? I want to read you some of their statements. In the Republic, Plato claimed, quote, a poor man who's no longer able to work because of sickness should be left alone to die. The philosopher Seneca boasted that Romans drown children who are at birth weakly and abnormal. The Roman playwright Plautus wrote, you do a beggar a bad service by giving him food and drink. You lose what you give and you prolong his life for misery. In the 12 tablets of the Roman law, it actually said this. It's crazy to me. Deformed infants should be killed. In the Roman world, there was no value assigned to the poor or the sick. They were seen as burdens. That's not the way that the church saw it. The plague of Cyprian came along in 250, but one of the things, as nasty as that plague was, and we'll talk about it, when it came, it wasn't the beginning of suffering. You see, the Cyprian plague came at the heels of a really, really vicious period of famine where people had no food and they had spent years and years in crisis before this plague came about. Eusebius, who's a famous church historian who lived back in that era, he writes about the famine that the Christians and all the pagans, the Roman people, were suffering under. And he writes this, rural registers that were once full of names were now all but obliterated since lack of food and disease destroyed almost the entire population at the same time. Some bartered their most precious possessions from the smallest scrap of food from those better supplied, while others sold their things little by little until they were reduced to desperation. Some shriveled like ghosts of the departed, staggered about until they fell down, and as they lay in the middle of the streets, they would beg for a small scrap of bread, and with their last gasp, cry out that they were hungry. Anything more than this anguish, anguished cry was beyond them. The wealthier classes, astonished at the mass of beggars, changed to a hard and merciless attitude since they assumed that before long they'd be no longer they'd be no better off. In the middle of the city squares and narrow lanes, naked bodies lay scattered about, unburied for days on end, a most pitiful spectacle. That is not our reality. We're, we're nowhere near that. But can you imagine what it would have been like to live with that being your reality? With that kind of extreme things? I mean, we're being asked to be uncomfortable. This coronavirus is a serious thing. But imagine that being your reality. When you walk around, it's just death all around you. No food, starvation. How did the church respond to this famine? It is absolutely beautiful. I'm jealous of this kind of faith. In the early church, there was a document called the Didache that called all Christians, commanded them to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. So they fasted two days a week. And so they, in prayer, it said that you ask God for what you do not have. But in fasting, you're laying down what you do have to show God that he's more precious to you. But see, in the ancient church, it wasn't just a way of showing your love for God, but they fasted in order to show their love for their neighbor. Aristides of Athens writes this, If there's any among them that is poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. You get that? In the midst of the famine, the Christians fasted, one to show devotion to God, but they didn't stop cooking. They still cooked the meals and then went out to those that were desperate in need. And from a position where they felt comfortable or where they lacked comfort, they sacrificed to take care of the vulnerable. Origen, as an early church father who lived in that generation, he commanded his congregation to do this. Let the poor man be provided with food from the self-denial of him who fasts. So this is just the famine that preceded the plague. Everything is high, high alert. People are exhausted. They're, they're losing their hope. Everything is crumbling. And the famine ends. And there's this really brief period of time where it's like, oh, you know, things are going to go back to normal. 
And right at that time in 250 AD in Ethiopia, the Cyprian plague claims its first member, first victim. The plague works its way up the Nile River and hits the famous city of Alexandria where it kills 67% of the population in that city. The Roman army that was stationed in Alexandria then went back to Rome and to the ends of the earth and they spread this plague everywhere, all over the Roman Empire. And what did that look like? It caused violent diarrhea, continuous vomiting, fever, swollen throats. It led to deafness and, and blindness. It would cause paralysis in the extremities of your hands and your feet. Blood would begin to fill your eyes and your teeth were stained with blood that would come up in your coughing. And once it hit Rome, it just exploded. In ancient Rome, they estimate that an average of 300, this is crazy. This would drive Pastor Tom crazy. But in ancient Rome, they estimate that 302 people on average lived in every acre, every acre of land, crowded. Where was their sewage? It was out the window and it just exploded through the empire. And so one of the bishops who was a bishop of Alexandria gives us a glimpse into what they were suffering. He says, in these days, these days, writing to his congregation at Easter, and these days there are lamentations everywhere, and all are mourning. Wailings resound through the city by reason of the number of the dead and the dying day by day. For as it is written about the firstborn of the Egyptians, so now also a great cry arose, for there is not a house in which there is not one dead. And so the Christian church had been through famine, and now they were just slammed with this plague. And it doesn't stop there because you know what happens in the Roman world. They look at this plague and they blame it all on the Christians because they refuse to worship the Roman gods. And so in addition to the effects of famine and in addition to the plague, now they're being persecuted and put to death if they remained faithful to God in the midst of this suffering. And so Dionysius, who's the Bishop of Alexandria, the same city where two thirds of the people died, writes, first of all, they drove us into exile and we kept feast, then too by ourselves, persecuted and harried to death by all. But after this war and famine seized us, but now after we and they had obtained a very brief respite, this pestilence has overtaken us, which is to them a more fearful thing than all the former fears and more terrible than any other calamity. The plague did not spare us though it attacked the Gentiles in great force. And so the plague expands. It gets, it gets even crazier. And this is every day at the peak of the, the Cyprian plague, 5,000 people were dying every day in the city of Rome. Stop for a moment and imagine that because the population of Rome was not bigger than Broward County at that time. It was not bigger than Broward County at the time. And so if you've got 5,000 people dying a day or 150,000 people dying in a month, that's the equivalent of plantation being entirely wiped out. Tamarack, entirely wiped out, both cities, that big of loss. And if we're honest, like we think about what's going on with the coronavirus now and, and we freak out thinking, man, I hope it's done by summer. I hope it's done by August. The Cyprian plague lasted 20 years. So it was measured not in days, not in weeks or months or years, but two decades. And it killed emperors at its bookends, killing Emperor Hostilian in 251 AD and Claudius Gothicus in 270 AD. 20 years of this kind of suffering. Eusebius, the church historian, wrote, no less horrible was the plague that infected every house especially those that survived the famine because they were stocked in food. Let me stop there and explain to you what Eusebius is saying. All these people are dying of famine, right? All the poor are dying of famine. They're out begging in the streets. But the uber wealthy, what did they do? They hoarded up all their wealth. They stockpiled it. And it was believed that the rot that came out of this overabundance actually gave birth to the plague, and so this plague spread, Eusebius says, the affluent rulers, governors, and numerous officials, as if intentionally left 
by the famine for the plague, suffered a sudden bitter death. He goes on, moaning was heard everywhere and funeral processions were seen in every land, square and street with the usual flute playing and breast beating, death waging war with the two weapons of plague and famine quickly devoured whole families so that the two, two or three bodies might be removed for burial in a single funeral procession. Can you imagine 20 years of that? Imagine the economic toll. Imagine the, the emotional toll. Imagine what it did to families. Imagine the fear. How did the church respond? We know what they did in the plague of famine. They fasted and gave away their food. What did they do? During the plague, this church that had been starved in famine, this church that had been ravaged by disease, this church that was viciously persecuted by the very people they were trying to feed. We're told Dionysius, the Bishop of Alexandria, where it hit the hardest, tells us what they did. Most of our brethren showed love and loyalty and not sparing themselves while helping one another, tending to the sick with no thought of danger and gladly departing this life with them after becoming infected with their disease. Many who nursed others to health died themselves, thus transferring death to themselves. In other words, they went and nursed and helped out other people. And when they got well, the Christians often got inflicted and saw it as a Christ-like way of, of dying, taking the sickness upon themselves so they could bring health to the city. And Jesus laid this example down. He says in the gospel of John, no greater love has any man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Dionysius continues, he says, the best of our own brothers lost their lives this way. They would embrace them, wash them, and dress them in burial clothes, and soon receive the same services themselves. The heathen were exact, exactly the opposite. They pushed away from those with the first signs of disease, and they fled from their dearest. They even threw them half dead into the roads and treated the unburied corpses like refuse in hope of avoiding the plague of death, for which all their efforts was difficult to escape. It's interesting, a lot of people wonder if the Christians running into these cities and caring for those that were diseased, they wonder if that helped the spread of the disease. And a church historian, or actually just regular historian, Rodney Stark, did a bunch of research, and what he found is the cities that had these communities of Christians had the slowest rates of infection, two-thirds sometimes less than the typical cities. Why? Because as these Christians went into these cities... Knowing that it could cost them their life, what did they do? They buried the dead. They treated bandages. They cleaned up sewage and open wounds and, and bloodied things. And they brought sanitation to the cities and it stopped the spread of the disease. Or at least slowed it significantly. And so as a result of the plague, the Romans, who once tormented the church began to join it. Can you imagine this? If you're one of those people that is without Christ and you're living your life and you're living your life for the pursuit of money and you're living your life because you're climbing the ladder and you're living your life because of all these things that the world has to offer and all of a sudden a plague like that just comes and throws all of it on its head. What do you live for now? And so everybody else loses hope. Everybody else falls to despair. Everybody else loses their joy. And the Christians come bounding in joy, recognizing the severity of this, but willing to take what they have, their lives even, and to lay it down to help the vulnerable. You see, right now, there's a lot of people that are vulnerable. There's going to be people that are vulnerable financially. There's going to be people that are vulnerable in their jobs. But even greater numbers than that are emotionally vulnerable. They're looking for anywhere to find peace. They're looking for anywhere where they can stand and it's solid underneath their feet. And this is the opportunity for Christians 
not because we're so amazing, but because he's so amazing, to point them to a God who gives promises and an eternal inheritance that can't be shaken. All the idols of this world are falling apart. And God is on his throne. If you're in him, your inheritance is absolutely secure. And when the world saw what those believers had and how precious the Lord was and that they were willing to trade everything to chase after him, the world wanted some of it. Eusebius writes this. I love this. He says, the zeal and the piety of Christians were obvious to all the heathen. And this awful adversity, they alone gave practical proof of their sympathy and humanity. All day long, some of them tended to the dying and to their burial, countless numbers with no one to care for them. Others gathered a multitude from all parts of the city who were withered from famine and distributed bread to them all. Listen to this. So that their deeds were on everyone's lips and they glorified the God of the Christians. <laughs> that sound awesome. He goes on, such actions convinced them that they alone were pious and truly reverent to God. After all this, God, the, the great heavenly champion of the Christians, having displayed his wrath to all men in return for their brutal assault against us, he restored his providence to us again and caused the light of peace to shine on us out of black darkness, as it were, making it clear to all that God himself had constantly been overseeing our affairs. 20 years, famine, suffering. And at the end of it, when you see all the glory emerge and how God has saved lives eternally through this plague. And Eusebius can say God himself had constantly been overseeing our affairs. There's not one bit of this pandemic that is not under the control of God and Christians should have the imagination of faith to know that he is using it for our good and for his glory. He is going to bring people to himself by tearing down their idols. Yeah, this is frightening. Yeah, I'm not up here ignoring the fact that this is frightening. I've got a family. I've got all the same fears that you do, but I know my God. I know the character of my God and therefore I can look in the middle of this crisis and get excited with imagination of what he's going to do and bringing a far greater treasure to the city of Fort Lauderdale, South Florida, to our country, to the world. Plagues shake people's idols. They force unbelievers to recognize the fragility of life, the emptiness of all the material goods that we store up, the illusion of control that we have, the humbling realization that this tiny microscopic little germ can bring humanity to its knees. We're not that powerful. There has to be more. As Christians, meanwhile, with, uh, back then, they had a far worse lot in life than the pagan world. They were persecuted in addition to all these other things. And they did it with love and joy and peace. Why? How could they do that? Cyprian, who is the Bishop of Carthage during this time, who describes, and the plague is named after him because he describes it so vividly in his sermons. The people were able to do that because they had the kind of hope that came from this sort of truth. We regard paradise as our country. Why do we not hasten and run that we may behold our country? What a pleasure is there in the heavenly kingdom without the fear of death and how lofty and perpetual a happiness with the eternity of living. There we find the glorious company of the apostles. There merciful men are rewarded who by feeding and helping the poor have done the works of righteousness, who keeping the Lord's precepts have transferred, hear this, have transferred their earthly possessions to the heavenly treasuries where they can never be taken away. To these, beloved brethren, let us hasten with an eager desire. Let us crave quickly to be with them and quickly to come to Christ. May God behold this, our eager desire, May the Lord Christ look upon this purpose of our mind and faith 
He who will give the larger rewards of his glory to those who desire him more than they desire the world. Our faith compels us to use our various positions of security, guys. To practice faith and self-denial. To love and care for the most vulnerable among us. It may not be safe to our own worldly treasure. But the people of God are concerned with far different sorts of treasure. You. You are the treasured possession of God. All this stuff will perish. You will go on forever. When we look around at our neighbors, they are immortal creatures. They will go on forever. And so let's not spend all of our energies and fear and anxieties making sure that we hoard everything to ourselves. But let's use this opportunity to deny ourselves and to pour out into those that are vulnerable for the sake of Christ who laid aside all blessings for us. Let me pray for us and I'm going to invite our panel to come up and we're going to talk a little bit and answer some questions that you might be having. If you haven't yet submitted a question to our Facebook feed, please do so. Um, we'd love to, to answer those and just discuss them and, and talk about these anxieties, very real fears that we're walking through at this time. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you so much that even when we talk about all of these heroic Christians that would cast aside themselves and they would chase after your glory. They would pour out their lives to lift up those that were less vulnerable for the, the hungry, for the poor, for the, the diseased. Even still, your love is more heroic for what you've done for me. You've laid aside the heavenly riches to come into a world where you were hated, you were persecuted. You took all my affirmities upon yourself. You laid aside the treasure. You experienced homelessness. You entered into all my suffering. Why? So that you could give me security. So that you could give me a food that never perishes. That you could nourish my soul. That you could give me hope beyond this world that just slips through our fingers. But you could give me one that's unshakable. Lord, help me to be more like you. Help me imitate these bold Christians as they imitate you. What love is that? You're so good. Lord, I pray that you would give us and your perfect love, that your perfect love would cast out fear. Give us a boldness in the midst of this fear to love well as your people. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, come on up. Thank you, sir. No, wait, sorry. Yeah. We're all six feet apart from each other. It's just an <laughs> illusion of the camera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there is less than 10 of us, right? There is nine. Less than, ten. Less than, less than nine. ten. Nicole and Leonard in the safe zone. Yeah. And Jeffrey D, our sound guy. There's Jeffrey our nine. <laughs> you realize that they could be doing anything they want right now. They could be putting, you know, filters on their faces. They could... They've already added the overweight filter. Yeah, you know, this camera adds 40 pounds. Oh, camera adds 40 particularly pounds. on this side of the stage. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> so we're up on both uh, Facebook and YouTube. If wrong. anybody has questions or wants to send a comment in, um, they can do that. I think that the first thing that occurs to probably everybody that's watching is that uh, and Bryce Brown, for example, said that he was praying for revival. Mm. How do you guys see this as an opportunity to bring revival to this city? Anybody? Question for anybody. 
I'll go first. I know that for me, I've been having a lot of conversations with a lot of my friends and a lot of my neighbors who don't believe in God, um, or maybe they're just not really sure where they stand in reference to spirituality and God, but they're very curious and they're hungry to know more. And a lot of them are people that I've been praying to have those conversations with for a very long time. And so personally, I know that the Holy Spirit has just been exciting me to see him moving in my friends and in the people that I love. And so that is just like a small glimpse that I've had this week alone. And it gets me excited to think about that happening all over our city, all over our nation and all across the world. Not to be maudlin, but have you found that people are, are more concerned about dying in this sort of environment? I mean, it's just to be pretty practical, everybody is worried about getting sick, but I think they've had enough people that have, have died from this. That Are you finding people concerned about that? Yeah, for sure. I think fear, like you said, Sam, I think it has a way of shaking us. And a lot of what I'm hearing is people who, in light of that fear, are starting to think more what could what is what is after this like is there more there has to be more than this and i so i i do think there's a fear of death in that but definitely just this unanimous um there has to be more there has to be more than this life is what i keep hearing among people yeah i think one of the things that that you see is you study revivals and honestly I, that's what i've been doing for the last couple of months mm -hmm. so i've just been reading non-stop hopefully revival longer books. than that tom yeah <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm back into it, Matt. So uh, okay. this is my revival cycle in this part of the year. But, um, <laughs> but I've been reading books about it nonstop. One of the things that you see again and again and again, uh, not every time, but a lot of the times, you'll see revival coupled with some kind of a tragedy, with some kind of a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, as, as a church, we've been praying for revival. As Church United in the city, we've been praying for revival. Um, we've been talking about it a lot as a group of pastors uh, who help sort of shepherd that movement. And as soon as this started happening, you know, I started getting text messages from these guys going, hey, man, we've been praying for revival. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is an instrument that God is going to use to, to help bring it. I mean, I, I do think that it, as Sam talked about, you know, and, and my goodness, I mean, what we're talking about is so yeah. dramatically different from what he described. I mean, it was humbling to hear that. But, um, but it does shake us. It, okay. it, it shakes the core of the things that we trust in and it, it leaves them empty. Like all of a sudden our answers aren't answers anymore. And it does really um, put us in touch with the fragility of life and, and with the reality of our mortality. And it makes us kind of take our heads up out of our computers, if you will, mm -hmm. out of our works, out of our distraction, whatever it is that we occupy ourselves with and go, huh. But thank goodness the internet is holding up because what yeah. would we do without our computers? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything's removed. Hi, everybody at home. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So Sam was describing the response to the Cyprian plague, which obviously the Christians in that time were doing incredibly brave and, and some might even say foolish things, running in and, as you said, being glad, almost glad mm -hmm. when, the, when they took the plague into themselves. If I spent 20 years doing that, I'd be like, bring it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Sorry. Just from a practical standpoint, how should we be reacting to it now? I mean, we're being told to stay in our houses and not be around people and everything else. Should Christians be doing that? Should we be doing going out and knocking on doors? Do you need any help? I mean, what do you think we should be doing? Well, not right now. Okay. Right now, I mean, the government's advice is not to run toward the sick. So okay. we, as, a, as Christians, we want to obey that. And plus, it's really important that we slow this right. so that it doesn't spread everywhere. And so one of the most, the best things you can do to love your neighbor right now is to obey what guidance the government's giving you. Stay, stay away home, from your Stay neighbor. away from people. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. But one of the ways, thankfully, to technology that we can do that, like Tom, Tom was talking about this earlier today, there's different types of vulnerability, right? There's a lot of people that are emotionally vulnerable right now. You can serve them by picking up a phone yeah. and you can serve them powerfully. Right. You know, we're going through this Lenten season right now. We're doing this campaign of prayer. And one of the reasons for Lent is that when you're fasting, it's supposed to remind you of God. Every time you come across something that you, don't, you have to give up. Well, C.S. Lewis has this quote, when you come across a season where there's tremendous amounts of anxiety and fear, it reminds you to center your heart and your thoughts on God all the time because you're living constantly in things that are beyond your control. C.S. Lewis says this, and I think this is dead on. He says, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, 
speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And what I take out of that is when I see something like this, like we don't look to God when things are, are rosy and when we have abundance. So if I'm God and I love my people, what do I do? You know, well, is it loving that he might be trying to show us that the world can't save us? That raises another question. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in the, in the kind of the edges maybe of the Christian community that have made statements about this is, the, this is the end of the world or this is God visiting a plague on us and that sort of thing. Um, Matt, what do you think about that sort of a statement? When you hear these sort of extreme statements from people about this is what we deserve, you know, this is God's bringing a judgment on the world or something like that. Um, how would you respond to something like that? You know, I, throughout the ages, people have thought this is it. You know, and yeah. it's actually interesting. There's a theological concept we talked about called, called the now and not yet. You know, they talk back then as though this is it. You know, we're near the end. Um, but they describe this, several things that will happen before that happens. And, and the scriptures talk about wars and rumors of wars. And that applies to, you know, these kinds of things too. But I don't think that's the, 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 the place we live as Christians is what we're certain of. And what we're certain of is the way we're supposed to behave right now every day. Mm -hmm. You know, we're supposed to get up and worship and love the Lord. We're supposed to be uh, in community with each other in a responsible way that, that helps them, doesn't hurt. And we're supposed to be looking for ways to need less yeah. and give more. Yeah. And we're used to just being lavished with so much more than we need that it's, this isn't a chance for me to really go, what do I really need? Because what I have maybe means others don't, and especially in times like this. Are we talking about toilet paper? Yes. <laughs> okay. Specifically about toilet paper. Am yeah. I the only person here who posted something on social media about folks at home can post something on social media about how crazy it is, toilet paper disappearing, and then your Facebook newsfeed has ads for bidets all of a sudden? Is that only happening <laughs> yeah. to me? Yeah. I, only it's, happening to it's me. It's a conspiracy. Oh, yeah. Matt was talking <laughs> about finding, finding worship even in these circumstances. Will, have you, what have you done that... Is there anything that you've done that's different as far as how you have found a way to worship in the midst of all of this? Uh, I think with our youth group being mostly physical for these for years and forever, yeah. uh, and Drew and I trying to figure out what that looks like. I mean, prayer, not just 1109 prayer that I think has kind of prepared us for this as well, but extending that time because I'm not under any necessary time crunch right now. And just like you were saying, like the pain... I've had a lot more conversations with God this past week mm. than probably the whole month beforehand. And I think it's pushed me into prayer and, and realizing what prayer can actually do. It doesn't just calm me and relax me, but man, it is saying, God, I have no control <laughs> over <laughs> anything. And I, I, and I lie to myself that I have control over anything at all. But this has definitely shown me, I think, the power of prayer um, in my own worship life. Is there something that anybody feels like they've learned about themselves so far in just the first few days of this? I, I'm surprised at how, how closely I clutch to my idols. Wow. Yeah. Like, you know, sitting up and being, you know, just being obsessed with reading all the latest headlines and trying to think how this is going to affect job security and finances and, you know, family and what it's going to do to the country, how long it's going to last, how long are we going to be inconvenienced? Like you start thinking in terms of you know, what's mine and what I control, I'm surprised by how much it affects my anxiety levels and everything else. Yeah. I think I've been surprised a little bit because I'm the anxious guy. I mean, by nature, really. Sure. You know, I, I think I've been a little bit surprised um, by how not anxious I am. <laughs> like, I'm the germaphobe. I'm famous for having Purell and I didn't need to go out and buy any. I had plenty. Did you bring you know? some tonight? Yeah, well, I have some in my truck. Well, Tom in my has office, made a million dollars in the last nine days. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> He will not. Sh I, I, sh Tom, yes or no? Are we Purell worthy? Would you share with us? Uh, well, See, I'm a little on. low right now, so okay. no. Out of love, I would okay. give as opposed to. Anyway, my point is, <laughs> um, you know, I feel like over the last couple of years, I've learned a lot of habits and practices that I'm putting into practice now right. that help me. I mean, I think one of the things that all of us in the Christian community need to do. I mean, Peter comes to us and he says, "Look." Always be prepared to give an answer to those who ask you for the hope that is within you. Okay, well, that assumes that they're going to see something different about you <laughs> that, that inspires them to ask. And I think one way that we can be different uh, is simply by not freaking out. 
Yeah. And, I, and I think that what we are are managers of our own soul. And so we've got to manage our souls wisely. And what I mean by that is, for example, I think that, you know, we are all of us consuming media like crazy. And, it, and, I, can, and I feel myself trying, you know, wanting to go down that drain. But I do think that it is an emotional drain. Yeah. You know, I think that we need to sort of limit ourselves and what it is that we're willing to take in. And, you know, so a certain amount in the morning, maybe in a certain amount in the evening, hopefully not anywhere close to sleep, at least if you're me, you just don't go there. He's mm -hmm. laughing. He's my son-in-law. So he knows all my little quirks. I pay him to be quiet. Anyway, <laughs> no, but really, I mean, I, I think a good question for us to ask is, am I spending more time praying? Am I spending more time in God's word than I am reading all these articles, than I am watching the news feed? I mean, the wow. news is designed... It's, it's a moneymaker. I mean, yeah. it, forgive me for being, you know, cynical about this, but it's designed to sell advertising. And so it, it's designed to create in us this, this adrenaline-filled frenzy that makes us think that if we're not watching it 24 hours a day, the world's going to end and we're going to miss it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to miss it. So, you know, speaking of prayer, and then I'll be quiet, um, you know, Paul comes to us and he says, do not be anxious about anything, which is... You know, it's like, oh my goodness. I mean, really? But what does he say? He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, right. with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then what's the end result? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard your heart and mind in, in Christ Jesus. But then he goes on. And in the next verse, he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you think determines how you feel, which determines how you behave. Thinking, it's a battle of the mind, and we need to wage the battle of the, wine, of the mind, thank you, wisely. Just to remind people that are watching at home, uh, we have, I have in front of me both the YouTube and Facebook at the same time. So if you would like to ask a question, I can see that there are still 30 some people in Facebook and we've got at least, uh, looks like eight or nine people over on YouTube. So if you have a question for one of the panel, please go ahead and, and share that with us. Uh, but I abhor silence, so otherwise I'm just gonna keep talking. If you all- I wanna, I wanna throw out a plug here for the app. Um, to this point, a practical step, if you're trying to figure out how to, really keep up to speed with all the information, but not get sucked into the vortex of that, that culture that needs you to have be fixated on it. Mm -hmm. um, what I do, the, the, the Fort Lauderdale Health Update at, uh, is on our app, um, on the homepage of our app, and it is awesome. They've done an amazing job of making it better and better every day. It's got the latest information. It's not sensational, but it has everything you need to know, and it has tips on how to take care of yourself and all that. I check this in the morning and I check it at night and that is where I'm getting my information and That's I have true. not missed a beat. And I do think as Christians, part of our responsibility is to be the most well-educated around so that we can provide help that way. It doesn't cost anybody anything to be well-educated about this. But how are you going to find out that a black pepper and honey combination rubbed on your left earlobe will protect you from Well, that's clearly what social media is for. <laughs> I will try to get that link back on the website also. It was there, and we've just been Can you zoom moving in on things that, around people? so Can quickly. You zoom in on it? But uh, it is on the home page of the app, on the home screen of the app. You do yeah. need to go there and just swipe up because it I actually doesn't it, show yeah. up when you first get there. Yeah, right. If It's just one little swipe down. Bottom yes. right. Unfortunately, the, uh, we, we don't yet have the three-foot-long smartphone option, but <laughs> one day we'll get that. One of the other things that, that we're told is that the world is going to know that we're Christ's disciples by how we love one another. Um, are there any examples that you can think, or what are some ideas that people can do to show love for each other? That I mean, one, th one of the things that I've been thinking about is the fact that um, it's great to send somebody a text, it's great to whatever, but a phone call is more personal. And if they're tech savvy, maybe FaceTime, what do you guys think about that? Something just to have it be a little bit more intimate rather than just a, yo, everything okay? LOL. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're doing with our high school, middle school students, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but FaceTime, I mean, I think we're going to get lonely if we're all sitting in our homes alone. And sometimes you not just need conversation, but to see someone's face is totally changing, you know, yeah. it can really make your day. 
There's only so much you can watch on Netflix. I'll tell you, I was, I was on, our, on the way here, I was talking to uh, one of our guys. We just have all just kind of started calling each other and calling people in the church that are kind of in our world and checking in on each other. And I asked him how it was going. He owns a business. He's very busy. And he said, you know what? Uh, I'm spending extra time with my kids and I'm, I'm spending my days calling people I always want to call and I never get to call yeah. and just actually talking. I think that's a simple way to do it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. One way that you can okay. stay in touch also, we've, uh, we've been sending out a lot of pushes through our app. We're also sending things out through email. We've made it a lot easier to get on our mailing list now. If you go to our website, riovistachurch.com, you click contact, little contact thing. I put a big green button. You can't miss it. The top page says join our mailing list. And you can put in your name and your email address. If you're not in our database, it'll put you in there. But we're just doing it for the news. We're not going to spam you with things. But just for a way that you can stay in touch and receive the resources we send out. We send out videos during the week. Um, so we're doing our best to try to keep things going and, and, and stay in touch with people. So that's one way that you can connect in there. And then also, uh, if you saw Pastor Tom's video today, um, Nicole Gonzalez, our outstanding graphics artist and media person, she put in a little video that shows you how to set the notification categories on our smartphone app so that you can stay in touch. That's overlaid right on the video when you're talking about it. That's also on the home page of the website. It was sent out to everybody on the app. It's on our YouTube channel. Uh, all of those things is on social media, on Facebook, so you can find it pretty much everywhere. So if we're not going to get a lot of questions from folks, uh, do we want to continue keeping this going or you're the uh, master of ceremonies? I'll, I'll keep asking questions. Go, go for well, questions. You, you, you talked for a well, while. No, nobody's asking questions, so I can make more stuff up if you'd like. Ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> we're dying here. No, we're not dying here. It's, it's I, fine. You know, I, yeah. I'll just I'll, I'll talk a little bit. I, um, Thank you. You're a pastor. Yeah, that's what I do, right? So you know, I think as we're looking for things to do, I, I was on a conference call, a Zoom call this morning, and I love Zoom. Incidentally, it's been great. Um, and people were talking about, you know, this is a really spiritually opportune time. Uh, a guy was talking about how he was sharing his faith with somebody in the office, and he was just stunned at that. You know, like this, never had that conversation before, but all of a sudden, mm -hmm. this is the moment. And he was saying, well, you know, but I can't invite him to church because we're not having church. And I said, well, actually, we're, we're all having church. We're just having it online. And honestly, it, it might be less intimidating to just send the person a link. And I mean, as you look at the opportunity, and that's what we need to be doing. We're, I mean, this is a challenge. We can't change the challenge. The challenge is here whether we want it or not. So we can embrace it and look for the opportunities. And so that's what we're talking about. That's why we're doing this. But one of the opportunities is, A, people are thinking about ultimate things. B, technology, everybody has it. Right. They know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And it's super easy to just take and invite them to church, you know, like that. I mean, I, I even thought of our 21 questions series going back into the, you know, archive a little bit and looking into some of those questions that we asked because those were questions uh, that we asked intentionally because they reflected questions of people who didn't believe in Jesus and that we sought to proactively sure. answer. And so, you know, there are opportunities like that, I think, where we can reach out to people and kind of invite them into the community. In fact, I think Drew's friend even commented that that's an easier way to, for her to, right. to enter in. If you want to take a look for those sermons on the website, uh, under the teaching menu, we have an option where you can go and look at the past sermon series. If you maybe weren't here or weren't following us at the time that we did the 21 question series, we polled our congregation and asked people for their, the, the questions that they wanted to have answered. We received hundreds of questions and we sort of distilled them down to 21 archetype questions. Uh, and then the pastors went through in a series of sermons and answered those. So you can go to the website. You can, you can access that 21 question series, look through the questions. There may be things in there that, uh, that you want to check out. So that stuff's all available online. Yes. Uh, um, just a couple notes during a time like this. You know, one of the things I love about the world is that it's created by God and everyone in it's created in his image and every morning. And these are some hopeful things uh, and we need to remember them. Um, in us is the image of God. And even by his common grace, God has all kinds of people out there um, who wake up every morning who are brilliant and who are thinking about these things. And crisis breeds innovation. It, it, it breeds, I don't ever pray for crisis, but when it comes, I know that powerful, beautiful things can come out of it as we all think together like that. And as Christians, it's what, you know, Tom said, we have this ultimate security. If we really believe it, we have this eternal security. These Christians didn't rejoice about getting the plague. 
they rejoiced that they could get the plague, that it wasn't the end of the world for them. It wasn't the worst thing that could happen. And, and so, you know, I look at King, you know, King David. So this guy could get, you know, he could get killed in the sleep anytime. There, anything could happen. He was always under threat. And he says this in Psalm 4. He says, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. That's something that only happens within. Jesus sits on a hillside and tells a bunch of poor, starving people. And, and people who are the least, the lost, and the left out. Don't worry about tomorrow. It won't add a single hour to your life. Jesus says that. The one on his way to the cross. I love that about our faith. And so mm -hmm. what it does is it allows me to let go of me. Because I don't have to worry anymore. And it allows me to think about other people. So I can support local businesses. Wells Coffee. I'm going to say it right now. Mm -hmm. Wells provides our coffee for Sunday morning pour overs. They are a wonderful family in this church. It's a small family-run business. And I, we want you to go get a cup of coffee there. You can do it online. Um, you, you can drive up and they'll bring it out to you, whatever. You need to do that with your friends' small businesses. Yeah. You need to be their advocate on social media and with your friends. And remember that restaurants are offering takeout, these kinds of things. Everybody's doing their best to adjust. If you're uncomfortable going in and sitting down, you can, you yeah. can pick it up and take it with you. Especially small businesses. The chain companies, they're kind of taking care of their people. So if it's a small, locally run operation, this is the time really to step up and help them. It, Pete Gockenbach was asking in Facebook yeah. whether there's anything that uh, we can do as a church to help the vulnerable people in our community. He mentioned elderly, jobless, and sick folks. Um, we have the email address, help at reavistachurch.com. For those that either can help or need help, you can send email in there. We will try to connect you with the, the people that can provide that. Um, and then uh, we saw City Church, one of our partner churches here, on their website, uh, made a donation there myself yesterday. They've started a fund for the service workers and hourly workers who are losing time because of that. You can go to the website there and, and make a donation and they'll see that that reaches those people. There's also a place where if you are somebody like that, you can communicate with them to let them know that you need help. Um, is there anything else that I'm forgetting to remind people of? That's a great word. And look at the charities that you traditionally support or ones you haven't thought of as the local ones like, you know, Hope South Florida and Four Kids and all these guys. Yep. What's happening right now is they're taking a beating. And these guys are the frontline service providers. Right. You know, they, we don't need to be creating parallel universes with new things. We need to be looking at these guys first and going, what do you need right now to do what you do well? Right. Um, that's a great place to start. And that's something that we, we're going to focus on that. We're not trying to reinvent any wheels. If people ask us for help, it may be something that we put together or we may put you in touch with somebody that can do that for you. So. Yeah. And we're going to be, that's one of the things I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be ramping up uh, uh, places where you can go and look specifically at, at ministries that have needs, that ways that you can specifically help um, look for those funds that help underemployed or unemployed service workers and things. And those of us who have a lot, and listen, you, know, you don't ever think you have a lot because there's always somebody who's got more. There's a lot of us, and I'm one of them, that have a lot more than I need. And this is the time, no excuses, that we have to help the least, the lost, and left out. Acts chapter 2 says that no one in that church had need because everyone shared as they were able. This is the time for that. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mark. I, I, I totally agree with that. You know, one of the analogies that I shared with Sam and I shared at that, that Zoom call that we have this morning uh, is the story in Acts 27 where Paul is in a shipwreck and, uh, and the ship is going to come apart. And the Lord has shared with him that if everybody stays on the ship, everyone will be saved. If anybody leaves the ship, then not so much. And some of the sailors are pretending like they're throwing stuff off the ship. And really what they're doing is they're lowering the lifeboat and Paul sees them. And he says to the centurion who's holding him prisoner, he's a prisoner on the boat. He said, if these guys leave, the deal is off. And so they go and they cut the ropes and they drop the boat and, and it just, you know, and they have no lifeboat in that point. And the, the ship that's in the storm does come apart, but they all make it safely a, a, a aboard or along the land. And and I kind of feel like there's a sense in which that's us in the Christian community. Like we are in this thing together. We are all of us in a storm. Um, and we need all of us to stay in it together. When we start self-protecting, when we start lowering the lifeboat, when we start going, I need to shelter myself away from all of these other people because they might ask me for something, whatever it may be, um, that's when we start to fracture and fragment. Yeah. Um, we are getting some questions in through Facebook, and uh, one of them has nothing to do with the coronavirus. 
they want to know how you came up with the name Out of Water for the podcast. <laughs> have, I, I, my answer is Sam came up with the name. So Sam, so you out explain. of water, out of water. If you notice all of the great judgments in the Bible that deal with water, water takes the emblem of death. And so God creates all of creation, new life out of water. He delivers Noah out of water, Moses out of water, baptism, which is a symbol of death and resurrection is coming out of water. So it's a cryptic name. But if you ever try to name a podcast, what you find is every single name ever has already been taken. <laughs> and so the idea of out of water was one, just the name is a picture of resurrection coming out of the water, but also talking about matters of faith with people that aren't there mm -hmm. is like a fish out of water. You're uncomfortable. And so that was another kind of route at it. So rife with symbolism. Yes. That okay. nobody... Nobody, nobody <laughs> it. Yes. Um, the other the question, definition. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> we have another question where uh, Richard is asking, uh, what would what you would like to see us as a congregation do in response to our worship time? I'm going to just answer quickly that we, my wife and I, watched the service online together, and you know couldn't stand up and sing kind of thing because I was playing host in the chat room. But we were singing along with the praise songs, and, and when it came time to, to have prayer, she got up and walked over and knelt down. And it was, you know, we responded pretty much like we were here. What would, how would you guys answer that? Anybody? I, we were talking about this earlier. You know, I'm already kind of excited about the reunion service. Oh, man, me too. Like, just yeah. we, we as pastors and staff, like, we miss seeing our people, like the idea of yeah. everybody coming together. And so I, I'd say, you know, join the worship and let it build in you this appetite for that moment when we get to come back together. Yeah. And um, I, I agree with that hundred percent. And I, and I would add to that, uh, you know, become more expressive in your worship. Like you can do that in your living room and grow comfortable with it really, because I, I think that the Bible comes to us and it calls us to an expressive worship. And I'm not saying that if you don't do this, that, or the other thing that you're not worshiping, but, but I think the Bible calls us to an expressive form of worship. And it's easier to do that in your living room. So, you know, when I got up on Sunday and I said, okay, guys, we're going to bring it. We want you to bring it. I, I mean, I was hundred percent serious. And mm -hmm. when I said, we've got a goal and the goal is that when we come back together for that reunion service or those reunion services, we're better worshipers than we were when we had to become isolated. That's a very real possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm going to be honest. The parking has been so amazing. <laughs> it has been great. I really actually am good with I how it's going. Right uh, you know, get better spot. at home. That's the message. Get it's better at home. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm going to freak it out right now. Maybe with a reunion, that might be a one service deal. That might be oh, a horrible we'll parking issues we'll deal. We'll I see. just gave Tom we'll a see. little stroke. We'll he there's no commitment stroke. to that. <laughs> and, uh, but on that, is seriously, funny memes, funny things. This is what the social media is actually for is funny things right now. Because uh, it's not about being dismissive, it's not about being naive, but it is about joy. Yeah. And, and it, it's not that people who haven't experienced struggle have this joy, it's that people who have experienced it and endured it, they are the ones who know how to have joy. And that's us. Right. That's us. You can have joy and, uh, and the world needs your joy right now. You know, I, I look back and, you know, when you look at this and it's, it's a very serious thing in the world. And, you know, part of the reason why I get excited when things like this come along is I am, I'm sitting here right now because my life fell apart after 9-11. I know many, many people who came to faith after 9-11 when all the idols got shaken, careers, money, everything was turned upside down for a season. And there was a guy in the office that, and I worked in the financial industry, which really got shaken. And there was a guy in the office next to me who was going through every single same issue that I was going through and he was joyful. And he had the courage to come into my office and say, do you wanna to go to church with me this, this weekend? And I remember going with him and I walked into First Church of God in Vero Beach and I can remember they were singing, come now is the time to worship. And I can remember looking around at that congregation and seeing a sea of people that were just totally surrendered and at peace in the midst of the chaos. I remember one particular woman who was crying with joy in her worship. Just, 
And I remember like that, that sealed it. That made such an, that woman's joy and her expression and her worship. She had no idea at that moment that somebody came in and made a conscious decision after looking at her, I want whatever she has. She has no idea. I don't know who it was, you know, but it was the aftermath of 9-11 that put me in the chair that I'm sitting in right now. Mm. And so I can come to something like a coronavirus, which might be much worse, much more extreme, to know that Christ is going to claim and extend his mercy and love by the means of even this, especially this, if his people are faithful. We have a question from Austin, who uh, says he came in a little late. Hi, Austin. Glad you could join us. Um, he was just asking about some ways that we can grow deeper in community, even though we're told to distance ourselves. And we've talked about that a little bit, but um, maybe think about some other practical suggestions that we can have. For one thing, if you're not part of a community group, if you've been, if you're like just kind of tuning into what's going on here, think I, I kept thinking I should join a community group, and I never did. Now what do I do? Um, you know, it's possible that there's still that an opportunity to get hooked absolutely. up with somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our community, Mason Brown, who's our community pastor and our community group leaders, are working on ways to 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 meet virtually. You know, through Zoom and things like that. And uh, it's hugely important. It's, it's actually an opportunity. You know, we all have a sort of imposed sabbatical here where we can get the important things that we always say we don't have time for. We can get those right. And um, it's a chance to go to that little extra effort of getting together as a community group virtually, you know, follow the rules, but do what you can do to do that right now. So um, one thing that they, you can do is you, if you go to our website, we have the uh, Connect menu that takes you to community groups. Also the connect button on the homepage of our app. You can fill out a community group card there so that Mason knows how to contact you uh, and maybe get you involved with that. I know they're starting some Zoom meetings tomorrow night even. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be that's going to be going on. Also another thing that you can do is you can join us on Friday morning at 830. We're going to have the our prayer time is going to be a virtual prayer gathering with a Zoom call. We had the whole staff on, on Tuesday and it worked really well. And I think that we can do that great on Friday morning. So if that's something that you'd like to be a part of, um, how are we going to send that out? I guess we can just... We'll push it to the big, yeah, the big list. The big list. Okay. We'll send it out to everybody. So if you're, if you've got our app and you've got the general apps turned on, or if you get emails from us, we'll send out that link to you on Friday morning. Uh, and you can join us. Zoom is really easy to get installed. Whatever kind of device you have. Folks, Tom figured it out. That's true. <laughs> He's not wrong. Tom hey, figured it out. If you're used to those conference calls, video conference calls where there's a delay and it's super frustrating and you keep talking over each other, Zoom's like way better than that. It, it is. It, it actually is really nice. It and really it's been fun. one of the nice things that that, that company has yeah. done is they've allowed um, K-12 schools to have uh, basic accounts where the 40-minute limit is removed. So they're starting to do that now to try to help okay. teachers out, which is really sort and of We cool. don't get paid to say any of this. We, we are not sp sponsored by Zoom. So. Yeah, I think there's also, there's a wisdom when we're talking about community, start building that now, you know, it is, it's inevitable. Like in my family, we have four children and we just became mandated homeschool parents, <laughs> you know, because all the schools are closed. And so I work full time, my wife works full time, and now one of us has to step down from a job for a season. That's stressful. It imposes a lot of things that you weren't planning on. It's going to add different dynamics to your marriage, to parenting. This is going to add strain everywhere, right? It's just, it's going to come. If it's not there already, it's going to come. So we need to play the long game. We need to prepare our hearts for that. And one of the smart ways that we can do that is by seeking out those friends, somebody that we're doing life with and not, not being an island to ourselves or trying to carry through this on our own. That's right. You can't. You're not meant to. God has made us to be in community. And so reach out. Find a friend. You know, and if, if you don't have a community group, reach out to us and we'll, we'll get you plugged in with somebody. Let's uh, take care. Uh, Pete, uh, Matt did not say that we're sponsored by Zumba. I'm not sure what that was. Zumba? <laughs> question to. Oh, no, we are sponsored by Zumba. We, we are sponsored by Zumba. You know, okay, I've been we're doing not some Zumba, Zumba and I highly encourage it. Okay. And Tom is going to do it with us. <laughs> um, he's going to oh, be doing man. Zumba. Yeah, because the hips don't lie. Well, I heard I, that. Somebody, mine lie a little. The great prophet Shakira, <laughs> the hips don't lie, they lie a little. White lies, little okay. fibs. Uh, we have a question from Mark, uh, who's asking us about, specifically about encountering non-believers, how to, how to explain that this is happening 
for people to turn to the Lord? You know, mm -hmm. is it, is it as an opening for a conversation about faith or, you know, just sharing your faith? What do you think, Drew? I know that my initial conversation with my friend happened because we were walking and I, she said, what did you do this morning? And I said, I just got out of virtual church. <laughs> and so I think sometimes as simple as just talking about your normal schedule and being bold and being willing to just say like the normal details of your life kind of can spark conversation. Um, and then through that, the conversation went a totally different way where she just talked about how um, on her own, she's been thinking about these things and talking with her friends about this. And so I, I think part of it is um, maybe, maybe tell people about virtual church. Yeah. It worked for me, you know, like have that conversation. Um, but also I think something that I've been doing is this whole situation has really kind of woken me up to the reality that I see a lot of the same people, even just in walking my dog or just coming and going in my building all the time. And I just have never really been intentional and I have never uh, seen those as opportunities to the extent that I, I would hope to. And so I've actually been asking God uh, to bring me um, at a safe distance, but in contact with people where I can just say, Hey, how, how are you today? Do you, or, how are you feeling about this? Are you okay? Um, and so I would say, you know, if you have people in mind, whether they're physically near you, um, or if they're through phone call or text or FaceTime, uh, begin to ask God to allow those conversations to come up organically. And I think we should be expectant. We should come to him in prayer expectant that he will bring those people across our path and he will um, move in their hearts and prepare them. And I think that's what God's teaching me in this whole situation is, do I, do I trust him? Do I actually come to him expectant that he's going to move in the hearts of people who don't believe? Um, and then I just get to be a part of it. I just get to talk and listen and ask questions. And it's not all this pressure. Um, God knows their heart and he's moving. So just pray for that, I think. And then keep your eyes open and wake up expectant every day to see how he's going to use you. I think that everybody is just really welcoming a little kindness from people at this point. Yeah. And just being kind is a great way to open up. Um, Linda in the Facebook chat uh, is volunteering. She says that they homeschooled their boys for four years. If they know anybody completely overwhelmed, she'd be glad to help. Linda, send us an email to uh, help at riovistachurch.com and just put a little note in there about that. And I'll make sure I'll put you in the help group and I'll put that note there that you'd be willing to help somebody if we hear, I just awesome. don't know what to do with homeschooling. Yeah. She's um, going to get a 10,000 member <laughs> waiting list. Yes. <laughs> Linda there are people right now running room. to find Linda <laughs> um, <laughs> with their children. What are some of the things the school is doing to, uh, to adapt to this, what's going on right now? So, I mean, the, one of the things that came to the school when they, when they started lowering guidance from no gatherings of 250 to 50 to 10, and then they said school is canceled mandatorily till April 15th, which we would have done anyway. But one of the things that we did immediately was kind of commission each and every one of our teachers uh, to be past pastoral staff, to reach out, to say, are you in crisis? Are you in need? You know, as we move to, you know, doing distance learning where it's going to require technology, you know, we're, we're loaning out our iPads and our computer equipment for families that are in need that can't afford that stuff or don't have it readily available. You know, doing Julie Brasington, we we're talking about doing remote chapels and doing like virtual worship for our students. Um, providing them with things, parents to help them with devotions, and the teachers are going to continue uh, doing virtual learning on, online through Google Classroom. And so they're developing a, a long list, and we've already had a major donor in our church that has, has stepped up to help out uh, some of our families that are going in crisis through the church, which is really just wonderful. Um, though nobody's allowed to know that until Friday. <laughs> okay. So Just everybody, everybody that heard that right now, I'm going to pretend this you is a flashy thing from Men in Black. We are, yeah. We're also forgetting. offering uh, virtual detentions. Yeah, right. Virtual so detentions. if your parents, Everyone's if you need suspension. to have your child uh, disciplined, we can do that virtually by the school. Yeah. Uh, Matt's not serious. 
that's his middle name. It's Matthew C for not serious. I just, I, I just thought of that, though. You I have already it. gotten a lot of, of emails and jokes from parents that are already starting the expulsion process of their new students. Yeah. 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 I, I, like, I had one mom. raise to, the tuition when this is yeah. over. Yeah. I had one mom who's homeschooling her kid tell me she wishes she could transfer her out of her class. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a thing on Facebook that said, I've had my kids home for three days, and I think teachers should make a million dollars a week. Yes. <laughs> I All do right. want to thank All Austin right. for the softball questions. Um, he notes that he's in Tallahassee, Florida for school. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, that's my, that's my Gator, that's my gator humor oh that's, that's for you Seminoles. That's the side of the stage, the, the Gator side got the of the Gators stage. Down here. You, 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 know, you know what we know about the Gator side I of the stage? We're well fed. <laughs> we are well fed. So um, Austin says he'd love to pray for his home church. Is there a place people can go that have prayer requests? Absolutely there is. Uh, we have a prayer button right on the home screen of our app where you can uh, put in your prayer requests if you have them. If you're local, Austin, I don't think it's going to work from Tallahassee, um, but if you're local and you want to actually come and pray once this has settled down, we're obviously not inviting people in now, but we have a prayer room here where people can come in and pray over the requests. But right now, what we really love to have is your prayer requests. So you can do that from the home screen of our app. You can just hit the prayer button, hit prayer requests and let us know what it is that we can pray for for you. Um, and then Austin, we can put that on the, uh, uh, put you on the prayer list. We have a list that we sent out email. Um, if you want to send uh, just a quick note, Austin, uh, to info at riavistachurch.com, that'll come to me, and I'll just make sure that you're on our prayer list. We send that out that has requests from the church, so it'll be an opportunity for you to pray with us, especially on Friday. Join us Friday morning, 8.30, for the Zoom call. Uh, we'll be sending that out through email on the app. And in case you wonder, um, you obviously can, can, can make this as anonymous as you want. You know, you don't have to put your name, but um, we also screen those too. And, and, and we're careful to make sure that nothing sensitive is broadcast on a big list. That's but right. We really do seriously pray for these things daily. Mm -hmm. And as a group on Fridays, that really does happen. Somebody's, uh, oh, Nancy's thanking the, uh, the panel. She loves us all. Thank you, Nancy. We love you too. Uh, I, I don't mean that insincerely. It's true. It's, this has been very cool to have this opportunity to interact virtually with our congregation. Um, you know, we had the sort of Brady Bunch chat thing going with the Zoom call the other night or the other morning. It, days and nights are running together for me right now. I'm working 24-7 right now, and it's just really kind of weird. Um, but I will say it was really kind of something that was cool about seeing all the faces you know, we got to see Mason Brown out behind his house. He found these palm trees that look like the, the Iron Throne. It's like he'd won the Game of Thrones. You got to see everybody in the different settings. So again, um, we in, invite you to join us on Friday for the prayer meeting. Uh, we'll be doing other Zoom calls. Community groups are going to be doing Zoom calls. It's a great technology. It is free. You don't have to pay anything. You don't even have to make an account to participate in something. So if we send out one of those links, you can come in. It won't cost you anything, and you don't have to even – you really don't even have to load anything on your computer. You can just run through the web browser if you want. So it's super simple. If you guys find creative ways to serve, if you hear about great opportunities, uh, even ways to have community. I know there are like some virtual exercise classes that sure. happen and stuff like that. Man, share that with your community. Share that. What's the best way for them to share those things with us? If they, to share opportunities or ideas. Yeah. Uh, again, probably the best way to share ideas would be to send us an email. Um, you can send it, either send it to info at reavistachurch.com and that'll get forwarded to the right person. Or if specifically you have ideas about how you can help others, they can send a help at reavistachurch.com. We're keeping a separate database of that. And um, when we add somebody to that list, when they volunteer something, we put that in a little note so that when we go back later, it's a resource for us to know this person has offered to be able to do that. Um, I know somebody offered to do sh uh, shopping for seniors, specifically in the Coral Ridge area. So they were letting us know where they were able to help. So we put those things in the database, and then as requests come in. A lot of people are concerned about seniors, and one of the things has been is the seniors really aren't sending email, and they're probably not even watching us on Facebook or YouTube. So we're doing what we can to reach That's out nice. to them through traditional channels like phone calls and so forth, visits. To, uh, to the people that normally minister to them. And we're going to be trying to get a list of the things that they need together and specific people. But right now, their families have been doing a lot to help them. So, you know, we're not, uh, we're not up against it too bad. But the longer this goes on, the more help we're going to need from people. Absolutely. Um, Amy asks us if we're good to please continue to pray for the spring breakers. Anybody here have a message to the people that are still out on the beach like this isn't really happening? 
Don't be on the beach. Don't be on the beach. There you go. That's wisdom <laughs> like from Pastor really Sam. Happening. Just don't I be think on the they beach. They shut the beach down. Yeah, they, they did. They, they did. Uh, some some right. of the cities did. Some of the we cities did. We were driving didn't. around in plantation, and they all the parks had yeah. signs up like basketball courts and tennis courts and everything else. You know, we just had a, a you know just yesterday or the day before. I think it was yesterday. Actually, there were three more deaths here in Fort Lauderdale of people that were in assisted living facilities. Hmm. I understand that if you're 20 years old this is probably not going to be the end of your life. It may not even be a big consequential problem to you. You may just shrug it off and not even have any symptoms. But it's so easy to spread this. And we have elements of our population, especially here in South Florida. Florida has the most elderly people per capita of any state in the country. So this is where they all come to sit in the warm weather and they don't need the coronavirus. Um, so that's really why we're doing this, to, to flatten the curve and hold things out and not overwhelm the hospitals down here that don't have the facilities that they need for people. So that's why we're asking everybody to, to do that and be safe. Um, safety issues with their drinking. I think it's a little late for that. If they're a spring breaker and they're drinking in Fort Lauderdale, it's a little late to have safety issues worried about. Um, any final notes or comments that we want to make for people? I think I've heard this from a number of people that one of the concerns that people have is that the effects of fear yes. are going to be perhaps even more drastic than the effects of the, the virus itself. And as the people of God, I think that's where we come. We devote ourselves to personal worship. We're constantly reminding ourselves of whose we are and the fact that we're in his hands and he is sovereign over this and trusting him with it and not overreacting to headlines and getting ourselves worked up to where we make impulsive or unkind decisions, but use this deliberately to draw near to the Lord and to our neighbors. It's like Tom said in his first message that, you know, that fear is a spirit to some extent that comes on you. So, you know, we want to be sure that, that we take the steps that we can to, to keep that at arm's length. Mm -hmm. It is not the time to panic. Panic is not going to help anybody. What we want to do is to be very purposeful and deliberate in the things that we do. Um, I'm just checking to see if we have any more questions. Everybody's enjoying it. They're all enjoying this. Everybody's telling us how much they're enjoying it. Okay. I guess we could just... Uh, hey, awesome. I, we heard something today. I think it's important to say something about this. Uh, we heard that um, a pastor had preached somewhere regionally that if you were a Christian who got the coronavirus, it's because you, you lacked faith. And... Um, <sighs> Sam, would you like to speak to that? <laughs> that is a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> it, is. it means Job didn't have faith. You know, Job got, he was made ill because of his faith. And it means Jesus didn't have yeah. faith because it led, you know, he led to the cross. I mean, it's, you think of these Christians in 250 AD who caught it caring for other people out of a love for Christ. Get out of here. That kind of stuff is, it makes me angry to my core. And that guy needs to not have a pulpit. Yeah, there was uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to say who it was, but there was a televangelist who was healing coronavirus over the airwaves. Uh, it's good to know that this is all over now. Yeah. <laughs> they stepped right in. They're taking care of it. Um, if he since he probably has his own jet. And in fact, I know this guy does have his own jet. If he could just fly low over the communities and just get rid of it everywhere, yeah, that'd be man, great. Um, but I do think so. right now we do want to say as, as the church, you know, our first, um, our call is to love. It's to love God and love people, you know, and um, that's what we know to do. You know, we can get caught up in speculations and we can philosophize about why bad things happen and stuff. But you know what? Everybody has to answer those questions, not just Christians. I think we have beautiful philosophical answers to those questions. But what we do know is that one unique thing about our faith is that it, it is model is Jesus. We have a person after whom to model our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to be doing right now. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that Sam said that I really appreciated, and it was, he was quoting somebody, I think it was maybe Kiprian himself, but um, I wrote it down. It said, we regard paradise as our country. Mm -hmm. That struck me. And I think that we need to be a people who regard paradise as their country. That liberates you of everything else. It liberates you of so much that stresses you out. It liberates you of concerns over your health. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you know, stay six feet away and, and be smart about all of this. That, that's not the point. Uh, but the point is that it frees you to give, it frees you to serve, it frees you to lay your life down. It frees you to live like Jesus because paradise is your country and paradise is where he is. 
You know, I mean, so when we go to be with him, Paul says it is better by far, not by a little bit. So um, Friday morning at 830 for the virtual prayer, we're going to be doing this on Wednesdays at 630 each week. So if you I mean, our, our viewer count right now is higher than it was at any point. So they're kind of coming in late and catching on. It, this is going to start at 630 on Wednesdays, which is our spiritual formation night. Um, you'll have a brief message. And then I don't know if we're going to do the panel discussion again or not, but we'll probably do something like this uh, to continue to try to build community and to have people stay in well, touch. I, to, to that point about community, it's yes. a great, we would really love it if, if for community purposes, you would, you would intentionally build this into your schedule Sunday morning and Wednesday night, just right. so that we have a little anchor, a little, a little pin that we can all, you know, hang on and say, this is when we all see each other. And this is great for us too. And, uh, Invite your friends to have this conversation every Wednesday night. Yeah, it would be and, really great. And subscribe to the podcast that, that Mark and I and, and Will and Drew um, have produced. You can listen to a bunch of those episodes. 42 of them so 42 far. 42 of those episodes. New Put one comes out car. in the morning. And you know what that does, really, because I've got a whole bunch of other podcasts that I listen to. What it does is it just keeps you in front of the Lord. It keeps your eyes fixed on the eternal realities, not just the temporal ones. And it's, it's a balm for your soul. You know, keep, keep the word in front of you. A minor production note that might be interesting. I'm not sure. Normally, I edit the podcast after Sam and I will record something. And I'm pretty savage. We'll record hour and 20 minutes and I'll cut it down to 40. So I'm whacking a lot of stuff out of there. I'm more hard on myself than I am on him. But I, I pull things out all the time. The podcast that's coming out tomorrow was one minute, one hour rather, and 12 minutes at its recorded time. Yeah, if you're going for I've, brevity, these are not the guys you want. I've got it down to a minute. <laughs> I've got down to an hour and five yeah. minutes, and I'm not quite done yet. It's going to be a little bit longer in our part of it because, frankly, there wasn't as much stuff that I could cut out. It was. I think it's going to be good. It's my favorite podcast episode so far. We're going to talk about the spirit-filled life and marriage, and that's going to be out tomorrow morning. Everybody's looking at me like, oh, they can't wait. No, no, no. <laughs> Listen, I, li I listened to it last night, the unedited version. The unedited version. It was, hey, it was really good. There's not really that much good. that came out. There's only a few minutes that have come out. That so was that's, really good. Did you be... tell them what the podcast is this week? Yes, I just did. The one we just had? Yeah, that's the Spirit-Filled Life in Marriage. about tomorrow. the one that's, that gets posted. or that got That's good. the one last week? The one where you and Sam talked about uh, complementarianism. Yeah, that's, that's coming yeah, out tomorrow morning. Out tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, uh, that'll be, I usually have it ready to go right at midnight. So you can, if you want to stay up late, you can catch it or you can get it in the morning. So tell them what the two of you talked about. And then uh, we talked about. We're going to be here for. We're going to be here for a long oh, yeah, time. Yeah, no, if you get them going, we're ordering pizza. The truth I mean, is. Tune in, tune in. The truth is we talked about we it. We have got to get dinner if we're going to. We yeah, talked yeah, about yeah, it for <laughs> several hours before we started talking about it on the mic. And we still went another hour on the mics. We, we talked this thing out for quite a while. Armor of God is what's going to be next yeah. week. We're going to be talking about the armor of God. So cool things going on in the Outer Water Podcast. You can get that on Apple Podcasts. You can get it on Google Play. You can get it on Spotify. You can get it on our Rio app. You can get it on our Rio website. We've got it pretty much should be very easy for you to find. Does somebody want to uh, close in prayer, 752, or do we want to? There's I think Will should. Okay. Will. Close in prayer. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we come to you now, God, just thankful that you're God who knows us, thankful that you're God who sees us, thankful that all that goes on this earth, that you're not absent in our lives, Lord. Um, and God, we just ask that you would speak to us, that you would walk among us during um, these next few weeks, even these next few days, God, just as we try to live life differently, but we know that this world is in your hands, God. Um, we just pray for a boldness, God, that we would see you clear as your people, that we would know you, that we would grow closer to you, God. Um, so that we can do something during this time, Lord, that, that we can live differently because of who you have called us to be. Um, we just thank you, Lord. Keep us safe. Um, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Sunday morning, 10 a.m., virtual church. Next Wednesday, 6.30, virtual spiritual formation night. There you so, go. Boom. Sunday.